talk about mixing software, uh, mixing music with free software. Yeah. How about now? <laughs> yeah, is that better? Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm Mike Tarantino, and I'm uh, here to talk to you about mixing music with free software. Um, I am a musician and a recording engineer. I have been a fan of free and open source software for a long time. Um, as many of you know, I live in a free software loving household. And uh, I came here. <laughs> yeah? And I came and spoke last year in Perth um, on, a, on a similar topic. I was kind of, I wanted to give that talk to explore uh, how possible it was to incorporate free software tools into a music production environment. Um, and that was a lot of fun. So uh, I'm back here now to talk about mixing specifically. Um, I've been doing that for about uh, 15 years working in the, in the music industry. And when I started out, uh, I moved to LA and um, I got a job, at, you know, an entry level job at a studio, which is kind of how everybody does it. And uh, the place that I was at was weird in that um, it was this fantastic room with this like storied history and this gigantic, beautiful space and all the gear you'd ever want. Um, but when I got there, it was being run by a guy who mainly used it as his own personal writing room. Um, and so. The good parts where they had one of everything and you could go and on downtime you could learn how whatever you wanted to use worked and uh, record your own projects and whatever else if you were sly about it. But you didn't get that kind of, um, you know, lots of people coming in and checking out how everybody worked and uh, networking opportunities that you're kind of supposed to get in those situations. Um, but those writing sessions were great. They were these like enormous. Uh, you know, two engineers and a MIDI guy and a synced computers and tape machines and a 108 channel console with every channel filled and you're constantly like trying to combine channels from the computer to free up a one more slot on the mixer to bring in one more drum machine or something. Oh, still? Is my face too big? It's not the mic's fault, it's your fault. All right. Um, yeah, so there were these massively complicated sessions, and it was great to be part of it. And I, whenever I got to do it, I was like, you know, this tiny little peon, and I was running the vocal switcher, which was this custom-made box for soloing up different tracks. And you could do that on the console, but they didn't like the switching apparatus, so they had the tech build his own device. And uh, so you'd be sitting there and say, okay, we want to audition the first three words from this line, and then the next word from this take, and then the next 11 words from this take, and they'd hit play, and you're like, and then they make the edit they want to do. And it's, those kind of jobs are, they're funny because there's nothing really complicated or involved. You're not really using your skills. But at the same time, um, when it's going well, you feel like you're part of this, you know, incredible machine that's like making music possible. And that's just, you know, kind of magical. But after 18 months, uh, that was kind of enough of that. And um, I was ready to go just do something else when uh, a mix session came in and uh, the band was Coldplay and the, uh, it only lasted three days. They were, there was this weird communication issue where they were sending files back and forth to LA but not getting any, or to London but not getting any response. And uh, so they, the mixer packed up and left and I asked him, you know, what I should do, explain my situation. And so we went out to lunch and he, uh, he gave me like an hour of boilerplate, you know, what you do is you work in the studio and you make the connections and, you, and what I was, had been trying to do before. And then um, at the end he said, oh, but you know, by the way, I'm starting up a studio at my place and you could uh, come and work there. And, uh, and so I did. I helped him wire that up and I helped the engineer out on the session that came into the place. And uh, when that guy was booked and the session kept going, I slipped into his chair and um, I ended up working with that producer for a long time, for the next nine years or so. Um, and uh, in that time, I worked on a lot of big projects. That was when I did the, uh, the big James Bunt record. This is me with him outside of Sunset Sa uh, Sound Factory, rather. Um, although it wasn't big at the time. We were uh, working on it and getting yelled at all the time and wondering if it was going to get pulled out from under us. Um, in downtime, I worked on a lot of tiny projects. Uh, this is me in my basement at the time with Baltimore recording artist Victoria Vox, 
who, if you haven't heard of, you should, because a couple of months ago she played with the Kiwi Lelies, which is this year-long educational program where kids learn to play the uke and then give a performance at the Auckland Uke Festival, I think. And that's her doing her thing. Not the guy in the yellow pants and purple hat, but the other person on stage. Um, so, uh, Uh, so after L.A., um, I moved to New York uh, to be with Karen, and uh, I was still going back to Los Angeles a lot and um, still doing projects at home. Um, that kind of got scaled back with the birth of our child, where I now still work on things and still mix, but mostly do it in nap-sized increments. Uh, but in that 15 years, um, I have mixed a lot of projects, and I want to talk a little bit about what that means and how free software can be used to do it. Um, I've been sticking my toes into the free software waters since uh, the late 90s. I had a distro that I unfortunately cannot remember running on a Power Mac 7200, and I could barely check email, and I you know, thought I was super cool regardless. Uh, and I've looked in from time to time on what you can do um, audio-wise with this stuff, and it's really been cool and encouraging to see the, the steady progress. And when I did the talk last year, um, I was really amazed, actually, at how far Ardor, specifically, the digital audio workstation program, had come. Um, yeah, and this year, um, in going over that talk last year to prepare, um, I was very much heartened again to see that, uh, that I feel like the usability and stability and kind of everything that you want has taken another jump, uh, which is great. Um, and I'm also pulled in the direction of free software, of course, by Karen, as I mentioned before, um, who is one of the smartest people I know. And I have no doubt that uh, when she turns her attention to mastering the ins and outs of audio production, uh, she will excel at it, as she has at everything else. But uh, that has not yet transpired. So um, when, I told her that I <laughs> when I told her that I was going to give this talk and what I wanted to do, um, she said, OK, great. So, so what really is mixing? Well, um, in the most sort of, you know, top-down uh, way of looking at it, mixing is turning a multi-track, uh, I have file written here, but can also be a collection of different audio on tape, um, into stereo. So, you know, and the effect doesn't matter whether you're dealing with a two-inch tape machine and a thing to play it back that's the size of your dishwasher and a head stack that's this big, or uh, a digital audio workstation program that requires a lot of specialized um, experience to know what to do with. Uh, the point is that you need this uh, uh, specific playback environment to listen to it, and you're trying to turn it into something that um, anybody can listen to on their car, in their car, or on their stereo, or on their phone, or on their Zune. And th when you do that, you have a lot of decisions to make. Um, the basic ones, probably, you've got an idea about, you know, getting the relative volumes of all the elements together, and uh, um, panning where they go in the, in the stereo field. Um, you will be using effects to uh, correct problems to transform elements into something else to give them uh, uh, more impact, more of a sense of what they are supposed to do. Um, and you're telling the story of the song and not getting in the way. Um, and what I mean by that is there's kind of, when you listen to a successful track, there's kind of a sense of inevitability about it where it's hard to imagine, you know, hard to imagine it any other way. It's like it just sounds like what it sounds like. You wouldn't want to change anything. Um, and if you're listening to a less successful one uh, with non, if you're listening with technical ears, you might think to yourself, oh, I didn't hear that kick drum, and now the, the beat's not working as well. Or you might think uh, that line in the vocal, I would have raised that 3 dB, and you know, then you could hear it better. But if you're not, if you don't have that sort of technical background, you still hear the same stuff, but you, you, know, you might think of it like, the beat kind of went away, and I'm not grooving anymore, and, uh, or I was following the lyrics, and now I can't because I didn't hear that line. And, 
Um, and all that stuff kind of it takes you out of the moment and uh, you're, makes you think about it instead of feeling, feeling it, and uh, all of a sudden you're uh, outside of the song, and that would be, that's bad mixing. So if you're going to do it with free software, um, if you're going to do it like I did, you're going to use Ardor. I use version 3.5.143. Um, and the CAF suite of plugins. There are a ton of plugins in the free software world. And that last year actually was one of the big, uh, a pretty large barrier to getting into using Ardor as a, uh, as a mixing tool. Um, you may have been able to get a better organized view of it last year, but I was not able to figure out how. So when I went to put a plugin on a track, when I wanted to try to find an equalizer, for example, um, I, you got this huge list. And maybe a third of them would say, have the word equalizer in the title. But they weren't sorted by name. But if you did sort them by name, some of them were called, I mean, one was called tap EQ, and one was called something else that starts with M EQ, and one was just called EQ. So it was very hard to get a, a kind of mental picture of what the options were. Um, and then, uh, to top it off, when you would try something that didn't have a very descriptive name and you weren't sure what it was, about, I want to say, 25% of the time, it would suddenly make no noise or um, give you intermittent static instead of the track that you were trying to affect. Um, so it, became, it was hard, um, from a, just from a... I don't know, it's not a user interface thing exactly, but it, it was kind of impenetrable to sort of get into what you could actually accomplish. Um, that's been much improved uh, in the intervening time. I, um, uh, the first time I did it, uh, without even remembering the problems before, the first time I went to add a plugin, I got a list of folders to, with things categorized into what they do, which is great. Um, the CAF plugins, however, which I knew were the ones I wanted to use, uh, were all sorted in a folder that was cryptically called plugins. But if you know that, uh, you can find them all and get to what you want to do. Um, the other issue that I had was with the version of the CAF plugins that came with my uh, with Ubuntu Studio, uh, you couldn't add too many, or you became increasingly likely to cause some condition which would make your session not open. And it wouldn't say, um, there are too many CAF plugins. You can't open the session anymore. It would say, I don't know, something cryptic has happened, and you must start again. Um, but when I figured out what was wrong, um, the answer was to, uh, was to get the latest version from Git um, and build it from source. And so I did. And I don't really expect that to get a big reaction from this room, but among my friends, in the audio world, this is a huge deal. Thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, that goes some way towards answering the question that I had of um, from my talk last year, can I recommend this to colleagues of mine? Um, the answer last year was pretty much no. I think you, yes, now. I think in the right context, um, it would be something that somebody without you know, a huge interest in you know, hacking and building things from source code and filing bug reports and whatever could, could get into and get some, uh, get some real work done uh, in a, at a fairly high level. Um, and that's exciting. That's really, really cool to me. Uh, so what are the CAF plugins? They are um, ways to apply effects to your tracks to um, change the sound of things. Um, some basic categories of those effects are equalization and filters. Um, that's going to affect the frequency information of the sound, um, give you more low end or high. Uh, delay and reverb, time-based stuff, where you're um, creating more copies of the signal but delayed in time. Uh, compression affects the dynamic range. Or you, uh, make the distance between the quiet parts and the loud parts less. Um, modulation effects sort of falls into delay and reverb as well. You're having a delayed signal where the pitch is modulated up and down, which causes this, these kind of weird swooshing metallic uh, phasey effects. Um, 
So let's talk about them. Uh, EQ first. Used to emphasize or de-emphasize frequencies that you're trying to get at. If you know what that is, bear with me. If you don't, um, it's just like the low and the high knobs in your car stereo. If you've ever done that and you turn up the low end and all of a sudden you can hear the bass drum and you can, it all sounds full and warm and then you turn up the high and the guitars probably speak a little better and you can understand the words and hear the cymbals. Um, you're doing the same thing with, the, with an equalizer plugin uh, with more sophisticated control over the frequencies that you're uh, that you're affecting. And uh, yeah, the goal is to kind of, is to clear out what you don't want to hear and uh, emphasize what you do. Um, the best thing, of course, and anytime you talk to anybody about recording, I'll always tell you, you have to get it right at the recording stage and uh, you're not trying to uh, need to add a bunch of, uh, you know, add a bunch of low end later. You should try to capture that at the beginning with the microphone. And that's true. But oftentimes, you're not mixing your own stuff. And other times, it's impossible. Um, if you're recording at home, you probably have a pretty limited um, space, and it's going to be tough to figure out you know, exactly how to get the sound that you want with, without annoying the neighbors and also tearing out all the walls and uh, putting in weird amounts of insulation and volume and everything. So, uh, so yeah, so EQ can help you kind of sort out um, a lot of those problems. Uh, the CAF e EQ plugin, let's see, Karen told me not to do this, but I'm going to try it anyway. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, looks like that. Um, like a lot of, if you've seen one, you can probably figure out what to do with it pretty intuitively. Um, uh, it's worth looking at the, the uh, yeah, the bands. There are three types. There are the filters, which are the ones on the outside. High pass and low pass. I have the low pass one engaged, which is the rightmost uh, knob. And for that, you just set the frequency. And the frequency is going to be where it starts to cut off everything at the ratio, which there is 24 de decibels per octave. Um, and at that frequency point, it's, it actually starts attenuating the signal a little bit before. Um, and I believe the frequency point is where it's down by 3 dB. Uh, you can also, on this one, go to 12 decibels per octave or 36. Steeper is going to be more pronounced effect, um, sound more filtered, and less steep is going to sound more natural. Uh, just, there's one thing missing. Do people know what's, uh, what else you might expect to see on a filter that's not here? Cool. Uh, uh, resonance is a control that's on a lot of them, and uh, what that does is put a little bit of emphasis right at the point where the filter engages. I see Bedell nodding, and I'm sure he knows exactly what the mechanical justification for building analog filters is and what this is replicating. Um, that's fantastic, and I'd love to hear that talk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, but what that does in audio terms is uh, really emphasize the frequency where the filter is, and it's going to make a less natural sound. Um, did you, you know, if they they do like a breakdown in a dance track and there's a snare drum going and it goes <laughs> that's the filter opening up and you know leading you to the breakdown where you start to dance it makes you dance so that's what the filter's for uh, the shelving bands are the ones on the inside of the, the just next one to the right from the high pass filter um, I've got the low pass on just to show you what it looks like uh, you can see it raises frequencies below a certain below the frequency that you select, um, and that, after a slope, causes just everything above or below that to be affected. Uh, and then the middle bands are the parametrics where uh, you set the frequency that you want to affect, the level, how much, um, and then Q, which describes how wide the curve is going to be. Um, higher values of Q go really narrow. That can be really useful for correcting problems if there's a I don't know, a singer with a really annoying bit of presence in their voice or a microphone that picked up a lot of that annoying presence, uh, you can kind of notch that out with a, with a narrower cue. Uh, it's going to be more apparent, so if you want a more transparent effect, uh, lower val values of cue will widen it out. Let's see, this is probably good. Oh, yeah. Now, there's no way to tell you 
what you know what frequencies you're going to use to make something sound good. It's going to be different for every instrument and every song and every person doing it who has an opinion about what sounds good. Um, and so, this is what you should do. Uh, for the kick drum, I tend to like 80 hertz a lot, and it seems like it's hard to uh, it's hard to capture that without also getting a lot of low mid information, a lot of like 200 to 400 hertz. So I end up um, punching up around 80, you know, a couple decibels at 80 hertz almost every song that I mix on the kick drum. Um, and the 200 to 400 hertz, I generally end up pulling out. That's pretty typical on on drums. Those are those low mids are a real problem frequencies because kind of everything, the fundamentals of all the instruments, the acoustic instruments anyway, are going to be in that range. And so you can fill it up really quickly and end up with a track that sounds kind of dull. Um, but if you carve that out of your drums, then you have room for guitars and pianos and voices and everything else that wants to try to cohabitate in there. Um, and it's kind of the same thing with toms, with tom, the, the tom drums. You end up cutting those out. If you do too much, you sound like you're stuck in the 80s. And, you know, that may or may not be a bad thing. Uh, for the snare drum, um, 1K seems to often be a problem frequency. Um, that gets into vocal intelligibility, like 1 to 3K is where a lot of the frequencies that help us to understand the words people are saying are located. And uh, snares seem to have a lot of that information. So you can get into weird problems where you try to, you know, you try to turn the snare up to where it's supporting the groove in the right way, and it sounds annoying, and you pull it back, and suddenly the groove's not happening. And often that issue can be sorted by cutting out a little bit of 1K. Uh, overheads on the drums. Same issues as before, cutting out 400, 2 to 400 can help make room for everything else. Unless you're trying to use the overheads for the main sound of the kit. Um, I'm going to try to say if one was better than it or worse than the other, but it's not really. Sometimes you'll be leaning on the close mics, you'll want really very present, close, articulated kick and snare, and then for that case you're going to use the close mics mostly and cut out the low mids from the overheads. Um, other times, the sound of the kit in the overheads is really nice, in which case you'd probably cut out less of the 400. Um, on cymbals, a really wide uh, boost at 10K is often pretty nice. But every cymbal is really different, of course, too, and you end up having to use your ears, because often when you do that, there will also be some kind of peaky ringing frequency that, uh, as you turn it up, gets emphasized and has to come down. Um, 300 hertz on electric guitar often sounds good. 2K, I almost always end up boosting 2K on electric guitars. Um, it just makes them sound more like guitars to me. I believe that's where the treble knob on Fender amps was, is located around, and it kind of, um, yeah, it just makes them sound like I expect them to sound. Piano is problematic, and because it covers such a huge frequency range, it wants to take up all the space. So you often, in a rock context area or something where there's a full band arrangement. You often end up um, carving down a lot of that with filters. Uh, around 1 to 2K, again, often can be problematic, and a lot of problems can be sorted sometimes by cutting it out. Uh, and voices, that 1 kilohertz range is obviously important um, for both intelligibility and also with too much, it starts to get annoying and nasal, and you know, you just figure out which is happening in either boost or subtract. Also, 6K, for some reason, seems to add a nice little sheen to me that I always find appealing. Um, I wanted to play some things to illustrate what I was talking about, mostly about the drums. Let's see. Ah, there we go. So this is a song I've worked on for a bit. I pulled it up in Ardor. Uh, this is the intro uh, with um, no EQ on the drums and the bass guitar. No 
idea what it sounds like standing like parallel to the speakers, so I hope this is, you know, you can hear it at least a little bit. Um, I'm going to play uh, just the drums and the bass, uh, still with, uh, with none of the EQ that I finally settled on. So to me, um, that kick drum is really kind of flabby. It's, uh, there's a lot of information in, in those low mid frequencies that we were talking about before. Um, uh, and the bass also kind of extends down below where I want it to, and it kind of obscures the low end punch of the, uh, of the kick drum. This is uh, the, just the drums and bass again, but with the EQ applied. Here is the whole track. So is that instructive at all? Yeah? Let's see if you nods. Good. Um, when, the, when the bass extends down that low, it's, there's a kind of counterintuitive thing that happens where it ends up kind of feeling like it has less bass, or it can. Um, and it, the point is, like, I'm trying to get the main thump of the kick drum to happen pretty low down. And if the bass is there too, then instead of getting a sort of rhythmic injection of around 80 hertz, um, then you get just this sort of constant barrage of information which reduces that rhythmic effect so that's kind of that's basically the idea of what i was trying to do um, and conversely if there's a bunch of that those low mids in the um, kick drum then it can affect where the bass guitar is speaking and you don't you get less of its rhythmic function which is to go thump 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 yeah um so compression um we use compression, like I said, to reduce the dynamic range, to make the soft parts closer to the loud parts. Um, that can help things uh, not get lost in a, in a mix, where you know, if somebody's voice, for example, is loud, but then sometimes get, gets quiet, if you can imagine that. Uh, you know, if, you, if that's just playing along in the mix, then you suddenly won't hear it, and the compression can uh, help you help make it easier to just um, to hear it the whole time. Uh, it can also be used to manipulate the attack, which is the first thing that you hear when an instrument plays. Um, it's the sound of the pick on the guitar string, for example, or the hammer on the piano, or the stick on the drum. Um, and it can be used to totally suck the life out of any recording. Um, and to illustrate that, whoops, uh, here are a couple of waveforms from some popular songs. Um, the top one is, uh, is Blueberry Hill by Fats Domino. And uh, what do we notice about that? The, uh, well, the, it doesn't extend all the way to the top or bottom of the, you know, of the available bit space. It doesn't even approach the maximum volume that it could, uh, which is, you know, fine. That doesn't matter so much. But what you also notice is that there's a lot of space between the peaks. The things that are hitting and punching are happening fairly, in, relatively infrequently, and then the signal is allowed to then reduce back to a natural level. Um, and compare that to the next one down, which is Michael Jackson's Thriller from about 30 years later. I think it's 82 and 56. Um, now they're different sounding tracks, obviously, so they're going to, you know, they're different types of songs, so they'd, be, they'd sound different regardless, but. <laughs> It's a lot fuller, right? And the, uh, if you had to describe the waveform compared to the one above, it's just 
fatter, it's bigger, there's more information, and the average volume is going to be a lot louder. Um, and further, the peaks are a lot closer, there are a lot more of them, and they don't, they don't uh, extend back down as low. Although, they're still very clearly defined, you can tell, right, where there's a transient in the, in the middle uh, stereophile. And the last one is uh, Shake It Off by Taylor Swift, uh, which in spite of that bit in the middle when she tries to rap, uh, there's, it, you know, it's basically a square wave, or, you know, when you're zoomed out this far. Um, you can barely tell. If you zoomed in very close, they would be, there, would, there are, you know, there's peaks and valleys and stuff, but there's also going to be a lot of places where the level of the sound is just completely cut, where the waveform, rather, is completely lopped off. Um, and if you do enough of that, it's, it becomes audibly distorted. Um, this, this track is not actually, I mean, I listened to it on, um, I've listened to it just on a laptop, which kind of increases the harshness that you would get from lots of distortion anyway. The, these, you know, speakers are kind of designed to uh, make you go deaf. But, uh, and even there, you know, it's, it's good, it's well mixed, it's, you know, it sounds right, like it's supposed to. It also fatigue your ears really fast and, um, you know, probably is bad for your mental health after a while. But um, the point is just that things have, you know, the, the trend obviously, right, has been to, um, to get an increased average volume. And a lot of that is achieved with uh, in ever more extreme amounts of compression on both the individual sound sources and on the you know, the final the stereo file that you're mixing. So for you to do that, uh, you may use the CAF compressor. Uh, talk a little bit about what the controls are. Uh, the graph there is trying to tell you what it does. Um, it's input gain on the x-axis and output on the y. There's a, can you see the faint line going from the bottom left corner to the top right? Yeah, is that... I can see it. Uh, that's just, <laughs> that's, the, that's the unaffected signal. Um, so, you know, whatever the, about the level in is going to be the same as the level out. Um, uh, what do we notice about the solid line above it? Well, it's higher, um, which is showing the effect of the makeup gain. I'm working backwards, uh, which is the bottom right knob. Um, and that's just going to be the amount that you turn up the output to compensate for the amount of compression that you've got. Um, the threshold next to that is also a very faint... Uh, no, it's not. It's not a line. It's just the point on that graph where the slope of the solid line changes. Um, and what the threshold does is, as the signal, signal comes into the compressor, if its volume exceeds where the threshold is set, uh, then all of the, then the amount of gain that is output above that threshold is going to be attenuated by a ratio, which you can set, which is the next knob over. Um, two to one is a good place for kind of subtle effects, four to eight for more aggressive. Um, and if you go as high as like 10, you're basically limiting, where you know, you're just not letting anything go above that threshold, like Taylor Swift. Um, the knee is set to zero there, which means that as soon as the signal hits the threshold, it immediately has the uh, ratio applied to the output gain. Um, if you turn it up, then that sharp change of angle becomes, on the graph, a curve, which just means that as the signal starts to approach the threshold, it's going to be attenuated a bit and, and by an ever-increasing amount until it reaches the full amount of attenuation. So, talk a little bit about how to affect the attack, um, because those are the two controls that we didn't talk about. Uh, there's attack and release. Um, and what that means is how long it takes for the gain attenuation to take effect, and then the release is how long it takes to return back to its normal level. If both of those are very low, um, then that helps you make, that makes it more like just a, a limiter that just stops the gain from increasing above a certain amount. If it's super, if, like if the attack is at zero, it's just gonna kill any, um, any transient information at all, any sense that there's a sort of peak sound that happens before the sustaining part of the, of the sound. Um, with lower values, but still not particularly high, you can actually create 
uh, a sense of attack that wasn't there before or emphasize uh, uh, whatever is there because the initial transient happens, um, which, isn't, which doesn't necessarily, which happens quickly enough not to get attenuated by the compressor, and then the uh, sustaining part does get pushed down if that's also above the threshold. Um, so by setting it right, if you've got like a lifeless bass guitar, for example, that's kind of thumping away um, and not particularly functioning rhythmically, uh, you can put a compressor on it to increase that and get more uh, rhythmic drive out of it. Um, and higher values uh, are going to just make it more transparent and uh, also make it do less. Uh, release. How are we doing on time? Oh. Yeah. Um, if you set a very low release time, it's going to increase the average volume because the, it will immediately rise back up to the threshold instead of waiting to do that before uh, it, uh, after, it re after the level of the input goes down below the threshold in the first place. Um, let me try to play you what I'm talking about. Uh, this is the drums from that same song with no compression. Here is a, uh, the same drums, they're going to be quieter, but um, this is the uh, sort of an extreme amount of compression applied to them. You hear what that does? Is there any effects? The snare sounds a lot longer, right? That's the, main, that's the main thing that I was trying to get out of that. That and more cymbals. Um, and, uh, and the reason is it's the whole sort of kit is above a certain level, and then it's all getting sort of crunched down so that the sort of decay from the snare that you get in the activation of the room ends up happening at about the same level as the initial attack on this extremely compressed version. Um, and what that lets you do, then, is combine them we back down to a sane level, yeah. And when you combine the two, the, um, the uncompressed with all the unaffected transient information and the compressed one um, with the sort of extended, emphasized decay of the snare, then you get that, which sounds to me like more like what I expect drums to sound like in a, in a rock context. Um, how are we doing? I didn't talk about delay at all, but I think we're five. Do people want to ask questions, or should I keep going, or what should we do? Simon, could you wait a Question, just in terms of if I get a vote in what we do now with our time, I'm loving being able to hear the differences between uh, two different tracks. Mm -hmm. um, and f for me, if we, could, if we could have the comparison side by side, so like, like play, play one track and then play the other track right after it, mm -hmm. and then talking for and aft but not in the middle. Is that possible? Um, Am I being too picky? Yeah, no, I can not talk. I okay. can just play stuff and. Because I'm, 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 I'm loving being able to he to hear to hear the differences. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk for 15 seconds about what was going on there for the uh, for the audio geeks, which is just. Um, does anyone know what parallel compression refers to? Yeah, kind of. Okay, so in this setup, this, the, all the drums are feeding two buses, and one of them is compressed and one of them isn't. And, with that, and so if you mute the compressed one, you get the first thing we listen to. If you mute the, um, the uncompressed one, you get the second thing. When they're both playing, um, you get 
the combination, which is what we want. We want um, both compressed and uncompressed signal for the transients and the sustain and the ambiguation. Um, yeah. Um, in the compression plugin down on the bottom left, I think I saw a mix um, knob. And I'm just yes. wondering how doing parallel compression is different to You're adjusting. Literally the mix. reading my mind. Yes. Um, the uh, mix is a, is a handy knob that lets you just um, adjust the amount of un unaffected versus the amount of affected. Now, in this setup, you can't see it, unfortunately. The, uh, the buses are. Nah, the plugin window's breaking them. Okay, the buses are over there towards the right, and there aren't actually any other uh, plugins going on them except the compression. So in this case, there is no difference except usability. I personally would rather see, like, you know, look down immediately, see what the level of one is and what the other, be able to adjust them individually rather than you know, having one knob that affects the level of each. Um, but what the parallel setup would let you do is uh, apply more effects to, apply different effects to the compressed versus the uncompressed. So if you wanted to EQ them differently, you could. If the compressed one was giving you like, a lot more thump in the kick or a really harsh symbols, which could easily happen, you know, um, that's kind of with extreme compression especially, it ends up kind of emphasizing the stuff that's already emphasized, um, then you could use some EQ to dial that back, but not have that EQ affect the uncompressed tracks. So I have a somewhat of a tangential question. Um, I, I, I don't know very much about audio engineering, but from things that you've told me and uh, producer of Karen's and my podcast, Dan Lynch, have said, there's kind of a garbage in, garbage out uh, truth about audio engineering. If your source tracks don't sound good, there's yeah. only so much you can do with a tool like this to clean them up. And so uh, given that a lot of people in this room probably, if they're going to do any of this, they're going to do it with whatever equipment they have around, whatever mics they have around, do you have suggestions about how to get the source tracks good enough so that when you start feeding it into this process, it'll, it'll give you the best results? That's my recording talk. So come next year to, is it Canberra next year? Uh, um, <laughs> uh, one thing I'll say is, uh, is controlling your space. Um, for, if you, you know, we all know, we know what it sounds like, right? When you try to record your voice on your on your microphone on your laptop and you can hear like it reflecting off of the walls and this sort of echoey but not quite horribleness and if you try to put that stuff into a into a track all those artifacts get in the way um, so I mean I've done ridiculous things like set up some mic stands with the, with towels over them so that, you know to keep the keep the reflections down um, I knew some people who had a closet where they just put foam on all the walls and were able to get a, kind of a deader sound that way. And, you know, you don't necessarily want the deadest sound possible, but if you have that, you can then apply, um, apply like reverb and delay effects to get a sense of space, whereas the space that you actually had available was terrible. You know what I mean? Yeah, so that's the, probably the, you know, that's a big issue is just controlling the space you're in and kind of eliminating it from your recordings. Um, I was interested, you said you had all these different libraries that you could use, and I know that, you know, um, people will always lament, they're like, digital, you lose all this, like, wonderful retro analog stuff, and, yeah. and I was wondering if uh, you could talk about, are some of the libraries in there sort of designed to give you back, like, you know, like, simulate, like, ribbon mics and Leslie effects and all those weird retro kinds of things? Yeah. Um... That stuff is not so great, at least as, I, as far as I was able to determine within, uh, within the plugins that are available on Ardor. Uh, there is a, um, there are a bunch of kind of like distortion plugins that you can kind of add in a little bit, actually, speaking of which, um, yeah, to kind of get you into that, that sense of sort of uh, equipment running near its limits, right? Like hearing the effect of, of uh, circuits that are kind of starting to maybe have a pro wonder if they have a problem or not. Um, and the, uh, the compression kind of uh, does some of that same stuff, you know, that can uh, start to correct for something that was recorded conservatively 
where you don't get that sound, and, uh, and it sounds kind of limp and anemic. And uh, yeah, if you run it through a, a compressor, that can be one way to start to try to get that get some of that life back. Even though I said compressors before, we're going to suck the life out of everything. This is the for everything I say. There's the opposite is also true, which is I don't know. Well, it's I mean, it's very frustrating about recording, but it's also one of the things that keeps me interested in it. Um, now seems like a good time to play the bass. Oh, this right. also has some parallel I'm processing. And I'll, what's that? Uh, just a uh, follow-up on that. The Ardor um, software will uh, load uh, Windows VST plugins, and that uh, opens up a much faster library of uh, effects that you can possibly use. Yeah, it absolutely will. And why didn't I? Um, I don't know that there's a... Uh, I didn't honestly look into it all that hard. I don't know if there's a huge library of, of free VLC plugins. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, cool. Um, so, uh, it's, so, yeah, worth noting, there, there may absolutely be better options here. Um, I also had stability issues still doing this, um, even, even this year. And so adding another layer of... It, it doesn't run them natively, does it? Like, you need to add... You need to... Uh, you, you do need to install Wine, the Windows emulation layer, right. um, but I think you can actually load them straight in now without uh, uh, yeah, hooking up Jack or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I w um, since I, if things had run swimmingly, you know, and uh, and I hadn't had any any crashes or weird weirdness, then I would have gotten more adventurous about adding in uh, more uh, layers of software. I was scared off by somewhat frequent crashes and and issues, so. But you're absolutely right, and, and there are many more options besides the, uh, the CAF stuff, even just that come with it, and uh, many other options that you can look into finding online to uh, enhance what you've got. Uh, what were we doing? We were thinking about... Oh yeah, listening to the bass. So, this is what the bass guitar sounded like without compression. like a bass guitar. With compression. It sounds exactly the same to me from there. So. This may not be the system to really demonstrate the in a pronounced way the effect that that has. Um, however, there was also some uh, Parallel processing applied to that. There's a second uh, bus of bass that's distorted. And the sum of them sounds like this. So what that second bus did that was running in parallel was add um, some distortion. There's actually, it's funny that you talked about getting those analog sounds back because there is, uh, I think they called it like the tube saturator or something like that. Um, uh, and that's what I used for that one to get the, get the distortion. It also, it, what distortion tends to do is uh, increase the upper harmonic content. And so from that sort of very low bass guitar, you suddenly get it speaking a little bit more in the mid-range. Um, and in this track, that seemed to be beneficial. Uh, we have time yeah. for one more quick question. Um, I'm very conscious of the time, but I'm wondering if in about three minutes you could tell us how not to go horribly wrong with reverb. How not to go horribly wrong with reverb? Um, yeah. Uh, you could, uh, when you say horribly wrong, you have specific problems in mind, like turning it into mud and... Uh, no, I'm, 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 I'm just conscious that you, you do tend to use reverb in recordings, particularly vocals, and yeah. it's an area where it, it can go very pear-shaped very quickly, and whether you have, uh, with what you've talked about so far, whether you have similar recommendations around yeah. or comparative recordings around reverb. Yeah, I don't have recordings, but uh, um, the big thing it'll do is, well, it just muddies things up really fast. It can. And so often what I find is that instead of, in places where you'd think you'd want to use reverb and make a, you know, create like a virtual room to put the sound into, um, you're going to uh, use a delay instead, which kind of 
gives that sense of space, and it, um, you know, it kind of simulates the early reflections that you'd get in the, from a reverb plugin or from an actual room that you're in, where you know, when I'm talking to you, you're getting the sound from the speakers directly, but you're also getting it bounced off the walls and coming to you, which takes longer. Um, so putting on just a little bit of delay, like on the order of under 20 milliseconds, um, and not super loud and not with a whole lot of feedback either, um, can kind of give you the sense that something is seated a little far back, a little, a little further back, or just put it a little more in the space, um, which can help um, sit things into the mix. It's kind of the classic thing with vocals, right, where you do all this work, you compress it a lot, and you, um, you know, you EQ up the frequencies that will let you hear it, and all of a sudden it sounds like that sort of right in front of you, and the band is back here, and kind of adding a little delay then to push it back once you've brought it too far forward can be um, a useful thing. Um, and then also just using it when there's space to, uh, you know, not when things are really full and when there's a lot of information happening in all frequencies and not when the tempo is too fast. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. all we've got time for, unfortunately. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. I can present you two with one of these beautiful... All right. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your attention.